applications of machine learning in, in low latency electromagnetic uh, counterpart in, inference from, gra from, from gravitational waves. So uh, to begin with, usually when I, whenever I have intro slides like this, I'm not giving the very first talk and I, may, I say that as you may have already heard, but this time since I'm giving the first talk, well, I've already said it, but anyway. Um, as many of you may, may know that uh, uh, the ground-based gravitational wave detectors, uh, the LIGO and the Virgo detectors, LIGO, Hanford, Livingston, Virgo, they've completed three observing runs as of today. It, it started off uh, in 01 in 2015 with the discovery of, uh, of gra gravitational waves. The first, first one, GW15-09-14, and in 01 there were also two more gravitational wave uh, dis discoveries. There was a sharp increase in the second observing run, which started in late 2016, went, in, went up till uh, August 2017. There was a sharp rise in uh, 10 binary black holes. There was also what this very relevant to this workshop and this talk, the, the one binary neutron star observation and the, the multi-messenger follow-up. And then uh, as of a couple of weeks uh, uh, now, there has been the release of the third gravitational wave transient catalog, which has uh, 90 confirmed events. So uh, again, another big spike in the number. Um, and uh, a lot of this we already knew from beforehand because O3 was the first time when there was effort and infrastructure put in to relay these discovery inf information publicly. So, um, so a total of 56 public alerts were sent out. And uh, again, for comparison's sake, in O2, uh, these alerts were not public, but uh, still there were uh, six uh, that were sent out during O2. And so, um, so, so this you know, tells you that you know, we are gradually you know, increasing in the, in the number of detections and, and probably very soon we'll have uh, detections uh, maybe every, every other day. Okay, so here just to give you a timeline of uh, what those public alerts entail. So this is just a time timeline of what happens after a gravitational wave candidate is, is detected. So the process starts off with uh, the low latency search pipelines processing the data in near real, real time, which takes uh, about uh, 30 seconds to about a minute, sometimes uh, longer depending on what type of search it is. There is some automated vetting done to the data, some data quality checks which are done in auto uh, automation. There is a uh, sky localization that is computed from the data. There is some uh, classification and source properties that are, are also computed. All of that information is packed into a machine-readable notice and it's sent out over the gamma ray coordinate network uh, uh, as, an, as a so-called, what we call the first preliminary alert. And then because there are multiple pipelines running, uh, they are processing the data in parallel uh, there are multiple events, and so they have to be clustered, re-annotated, the significance has to be re-evaluated, and, uh, and therefore that is done in the next few minutes, and then a second preliminary alert is also sent in, in an auto automatic fashion. And so at this point, there is human vetting done, so humans enter the loop, and uh, uh, they take a look at the uh, state of the detector, whether uh, any, anything unexpected happened, whether if, if, if at all the trigger was caused due to a glitch, and if, if not, then an initial alert is sent confirming the disc discovery, and if, if, if it is a glitch, then a retraction is sent. And finally, if there is, uh, if it is a confirmed gravitational wave disc discovery, then uh, in, the, in the few day to week time scale, there is uh, results from Bayesian parameter estimation that is that is sent out to update those sky localization to update the, the the properties. So like like this, a total of eighty public alerts were sent during the course the the entire course of O3. There were fifty six that were non retracted. So that's a, that's a num number I quoted before, and and mo uh, most of them um, uh, were delivered to within five to six uh, minutes from the discovery of the candidate. So a few more highlights. Uh, so what all of that meant was during O3 we had a detection every one to two weeks on in average. And this was because the detectors were much more sensitive compared to the previous observing run. So just to give some numbers, uh, the BNS range is the binary neutron star in spiral range, which is the distance out to which the detectors are sensitive to a standard 1.4, 1.4 solar solar mass binary neutron star. And, and that was out to uh, 100 to 140 megaparsecs 
for the LIGO detectors, and that's expected to go up uh, to 160 to uh, so up to 160 to 190 during the next observing run. The Virgo detectors, which were between 50 to 60, uh, would go up to 80 to 1, uh, 115 during 04. And the Kaura detector join at the very end of, of, uh, of 0, 0, 03, and hope, hopefully they will have a better sensitivity uh, during the course of 04. So some highlights from GWTC3. So now we have uh, candidates that have been detected to much farther distances, uh, almost out to a redshift of 0.8 much more heavier binary black holes that uh, have been discussed. If you were probably here for the previous workshop, you may have uh, heard a few talks about these special events. Uh, clearly, in the so-called intermediate mass black hole regime, binary neutron stars, which are heavier than the standard uh, binary neutron star, galactic binary neutron star population, they have been discovered. And then uh, binaries, again, with very asymmetric mass ratios, uh, have been found, and also neutron star black hole candidates. So the bottom line of all this is that gravitational wave discoveries are now routine, and the field has definitely moved from the discovery phase to uh, a regular astronomy phase. However, it's, it's not the same story for EMGW astronomy. And uh, even after four years, uh, this event, GW170817, which was the first ever uh, binary neutron star uh, uh, gravitational wave from a binary, binary neutron star that was ob observed, that still remains to be the only uh, uh, success story of EMGW astronomy. So just to give you a, a, a recap, so on 17th of August 2017, uh, the LIGO and the Virgo instrument noticed, uh, they, they saw this long signal uh, which came from a binary neutron star in spiral. Uh, two seconds after the mer uh, merger, there was a burst of gamma rays that, that were detected from independently by both the Fermi and the integral satellites. And then about after half a day of scanning the, this region of the sky for, uh, that was uh, where the signal was coming from, uh, this, this transient was, was found in this galaxy called NGC 4993. It was um, studied very exhaustively by telescopes all over the world, and uh, it was characterized to be uh, the, the kilonova, which is supposed to be this electromagnetic counterpart of, from the merger of two neutron stars. And so that was really exciting news. It was called by uh, different names based on who, which team discovered it, but eventually the IAU calls it as AT2017 GFO. So that's the kilonova of, 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 of this binary neutron star system, GW170017. Uh, how, uh, however, as I men mentioned that, you know, this is the only um, success story of EMGW astronomy till date. So what I'll be talking about in the next few, few slides is uh, some of the applications of machine learning uh, in, uh, you know, both from the gravitational wave side, so predicting these counter counterparts, as well as on the EM side, which is in photometric classification. So if you have several candidates that you detect, uh, how, how do you cut the candidate list down? So, so clearly, the, the first question you uh, would want to ask is, well, what mergers do we follow up? And, and the first cut answer is that those that have at least a neutron star in the system, because you need matter in the system to be present uh, to generate these, uh, these counter counterparts. So clearly, there are binary neutron star signals, uh, and there are neutron star black hole signals. So for neutron star black hole signal, signals, it's a, uh, or rather, neutron star black hole binary, it's a little, uh, it's a little more complex because it depends on whether this neutron star is disrupted by the black hole. And, and, and that happens, uh, that does not happen if the, if the black hole is very big because this innermost stable circular orbit is very wide, so as the neutron star is in spiraling, and if it does not get disrupted, it will be swallowed directly by the black hole. On the other hand, if, if the black hole is not as massive, and has some spin, which is shown by this, in this cartoon by this squiggly line over here, then there are two effects. The ISCO is not as big, so the ISCO shrinks, sort of, and then that tidal forces on the neutron star go up. And that is sort of exaggerated in this picture. So high spins, they promote tidal disruption and therefore increase the chances of having a counterpart. And so therefore, maybe a better answer is at least, you know, those mergers that leave some remnant matter outside, um, they are the better ones to follow up because the matter dynamics is essential. Uh, BNS collisions are expected to leave some remnant matter, but as I mentioned, neutron star black hole systems may leave some remnant matter depending on 
uh, the mass and spin of the black hole, and also something I did not show in the last slide, that is the equation of state of the star, which is which dictates how big a star can become, because the, the larger a star is, uh, it's easier to, to disrupt it. Now, of course, accurate answer to, to these are given by numerical relativity simulations, but uh, they are very expensive and definitely cannot be done in a low latency time scale. In fact, I think only order 100 simulations have been done uh, till date. So new, uh, these empirical fits to these NR simulations are a good use, use case. So, uh, so here is a basic idea. So essentially this, whether something will have a remnant or not is dictated by two factors. One is this tidal or this Roche rad radius, so the distance away from, from this massive body where uh, tidal disruption happens. Uh, so if that is much more farther out, that, that promotes the dis disruption, whereas uh, the ISCO I talked about, if that is wide, then uh, if, if, if that is large, then the, the secondary will, will get swallowed in. So it's really these two competing effects. Of course, this is not the, uh, the exact expression, but, but just a uh, qualitative way, way to express uh, uh, the idea of these empir em empirical fits. Okay, so, so based on what I told you in the last two slides, uh, the two quantities that are sent out as a part of these notices uh, are called has NS and has remnant, motivated by, by the last couple of slides. The has NS is uh, a more fundamental, a model independent, simple inf inference, and that is if the secondary mass in gravitational wave lit lit literature typically the second secondary is the lighter sy system. Sorry about that. Um, uh, that the 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 secondary is a lighter uh, mass, and if it is less than three solar solar mass, we just um, uh, at least in this source property we call that low mass as as has NS, um, and then has remnant is. Um, I'm um, sorry, one more thing is the reason why I say fundamental inference is because uh, the, this three solar solar mass number, this upper limit comes from very fundamental uh, physics uh, based on light crossing, uh, the, the speed of light on the neutron star crust. Um, and that automatically imposes uh, this three solar mass upper limit. But, but for has remnant, uh, that uses the more complex physics of, uh, of, of the neutron star uh, I'm sorry, the black hole spin and the mass and, and whether there is um, any remnant matter left. Uh, so it is not as fund, uh, fundamental. Uh, it needs, for example, a fixed choice of the equation of state or for you to marginalize out the equation of state. Um, but, 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 but those are the two quanti quantities that are sent out. And, it, and, and you need these in real time because the kilonova fades very quickly. It fades in a day. and, and uh, the Bayesian parameter estimation that, that takes uh, at least hours, uh, uh, if not days, to finish. Although you may hear talks later in the conference where um, you know, there, there are efforts to speed up uh, the Bayesian inference. And so your inference has to be done from the online searches, which are these template-based searches. Uh, so what they do is they match the data with a bank of templates. And based on certain detection statistic, uh, you know, a, a preferred a template rings off. So you know, if and if that uh, detection statistic is higher than a certain threshold, that is um, uh, what is called as a detection. Now, uh, the idea of these searches is to uh, maximize the detection efficiency of these gravitational wave candidates uh, at at fixed false alarm. Uh, and, and there are certain design choices made so that uh, this inference can be done really fast in you know, sub-minute sub lat lat latency. Uh, however, I want to point, point out that accurate parameter re recovery is left to Bayesian parameter in inference. So the searches tell you whether there's a signal in the data, and then uh, the parameter estimation, uh, they infer the properties of that, of that bin uh, binary. So, so some of the properties may be uh, well uh, recovered. So for example, over, over here what I'm showing is uh, a set of binary neutron star uh, sim uh, 
signals uh, tagged by their mass one, mass two, and the spin. So these are not posterior sam samples. These uh, are signals that are injected into the data stream. The search is run. And then what I'm showing over here is the chirp mass, the so-called chirp mass, which is a combination of the two um, uh, components of the bi uh, bi binary that one can extract from the leading order of the sig signal. And one, one can see that uh, you, you, you get very good recovery. Okay, so now, while that may be recovered well, some of the other parameters are not. In per uh, particular, let's say the component masses, for example. Uh, you know, it's the same diagram one more time, but then on, on the recovered plane, you, know, you don't quite see that. So the, the message I'm trying to convey is that if you take the output of your search uh, by itself, your, your inference may be biased, right? But that's all the data that you have at hand at the time of dis dis discovery. And so one has to mitigate these detection uncertainties uh, and, and, and re report quantities uh, like has an SN, has remnant that I talked about. So the way it was done uh, during the second observing run was by constructing these, this ambiguity ellipsoid uh, in basically a Fisher, using a Fisher formalism, which is an, a Gaussian approximation to the likelihood. Uh, so what one, one would do is essentially construct this ambiguity ellipsoids uh, around the triggered point and uh, essentially count what, what fraction of, of, of this is on one side of the boundary. So what uh, fraction is less than three solar mass, for example, or what fraction has, uh, has remnant matter. But, uh, you know, they are, this Fisher approximation is, of course, valid in the high signal to noise regime, you know, and also doesn't take into account any of the biases that, that, that a search may have. And so in O3, uh, we, we looked at the problem a little differently. So we use supervised binary classification for, for this case. So here the idea is that, well, in actual space, if you, if you have control over, um, you know, those, those injections that you're putting into the data, you know uh, which of those are, uh, uh, are less than three solar masses versus which are not. Whereas in the observed plane, of course, you know, you, you, uh, there is, those parameters may not be um, in one-to-one -one correspondence with that, and you know, they may move around like so. But now, if you have a detection in this observed plane, you can use that information, those, those lab uh, labels, to predict you know, which, which class they, they, they belong to. And so, so this is what we used. We used uh, a nearest neighbor classification algorithm for this, uh, although there is work underway to, uh, to utilize other techniques. Um, but so that is, the, that is what we used. And so here the idea is that uh, if, for example, here I'm doing a parameter sweep on the, on the, say, the mass one, mass two plane, if the search was, was perfect, then this, this color, color bar is the score that is given by this uh, classifier. So for an ideal search, you, what you expect is uh, a bright region down here and uh, a dark region above that. But in reality, of course, you expect a fuzz. Uh, and you want your algorithm to pick that up. And that fuzz is expected to go down as, uh, I'm not sure if you can read the label, but we are going up in the sig signal to noise ratio as, as we go down these, these panels. So you expect the fuzz to go down, and, and, that, is, that, and that is what we see over, over, over here. OK, uh, I'm, let's, let me just check the time. OK, um, okay so what I'm showing over here is uh, some of the events in, in O3, which did have some, uh, you know, which have a non-zero has NS score. So what I'm showing over here is their, their distance. Um, so one thing that Im immediately strikes out is a lot of them are pretty far, far away. You know, they are much farther away than what GW170817 was, which was at 40 mega megaparsecs. They're all much farther away than, uh, compared to that. And then in the bottom panel, what I'm showing is uh, the, the, the same score calculated from once the Bayesian parameter estimation finished. Right? And so most, most of them are in, in good agreement, although sometimes there may be uh, differences. So, um, so yeah, that, that's, that's there. You know, but, but, but for the most part, there is good agreement between the low latency results and the, and the 
quantity calculated from parameter est estimation. Um, so new techniques. Um, uh, so there is work under underway right right now by the Missouri S and T group to uh, to develop newer algorithms to to solve this problem. Essentially, this this is one which is being pursued by uh, student Mark, uh, Sushant Sharma to use genetic programming to essentially find this uh, mathematical boundary in the observed plane, which will act as this uh, E.M. Bright um, divide button in the observed plane. And then uh, there is also work being done to, to, to reweight this score based on uh, you know, not considering a single e equation of state, but marginalizing out um, uh, the, 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 the equation of state. OK, uh, all right. So um, I just want to stop and check if, the, if anyone had questions, because I'll just switch topics at this, at this point. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. How sensitive is the S remnant to the change in the equation of state? It can be sensitive. Uh, in fact, so the current implementation uses a stiff equation of state, and that is to be more relaxed in a sense we don't want to miss counterparts. We are being conservative in that sense. Uh, but uh, it, it can be sensitive, especially towards the, the higher spin value. So regions like, like these, uh, they will definitely be cut very sharply uh, if you employ something like uh, SLY, which predicts. So 2H, the current implementation, predicts uh, stars which are order 16 kilometers, but, but something like SLY or 17 or we know the stars are typically order, say, 12 kilometers. So, um, so it, it, it does affect uh, this, especially this, 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 this higher end, so towards the more asymmetric mass ratios. Yeah. Excuse me. Go ahead. Yeah, for this prediction plot that you showed, the, the the injections are numerical relativity simulations, or? No, the injections are actually just, so these waveforms uh, injected into the real data stream, but, but it's, it's, it's not numerical rel relativity sim simulation. It's, it's a, a waveform model. Uh, I, if I remember, this was probably, this would be a spin tailor um, waveform. Wave but, but there is currently work underway to do more um, you know, injections with more physics in it, like tides, et cetera, in, in it, and then re, re, redo the search. OK, so because we are talking about multi messenger astro astronomy, I thought that although this is not related to any machine learning, but I thought I would men mention about pre-merger alerts. So because we want to send out alerts as quickly as possible, it, it would be nice to send out a discovery notice uh, even before the binary has merged. And this is possible in, in the case of binary neutron star signals because the waveforms are very, very long. And as they evolve, uh, the signal accumulates, uh, you know, uh, SNR, essentially. And so uh, if you do indeed gather enough uh, significance as the binary is in spiraling, maybe around this phase, this point of the in-spiral, you can send a discovery notice so that we can actually capture the prompt emission, uh, or at least you know, send out a discovery notice so that observatories can start buffering their data, or if possible, schedule uh, start scheduling observations. And 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 so this was um, um, unfortunately my refer re references have cut out, but this this had been proposed way back in 2012, but uh, it was post O3 that this was commissioned on uh, on uh, the end-to-end -end alerting infrastructure. And uh, we uh, car carried out a mock data challenge, essentially. So what I'm showing over here is the alert latency. As a, you know, these are essentially the different observing runs. And what we find is a straight steady decrease in the latency, especially in the second half of O3. We were consistently sending out most of our disc discoveries under uh, five, five minutes time scale. And in this work in particular for these five alerts, there are, uh, they are either uh, the entire um, process completes within before the binary, uh, before the merger time of the binary, or you know a few few, few seconds after. Now, of course, these were mock events, 
uh, with with rather high uh, you know not not very high significance, but uh, but, but but hopefully you know, once this is deployed in in production, uh, we will see some some production events that are found in uh, found pre pre merger. Okay, so now I want to switch from the gravitational wave side to the uh, EM side. So here I want to talk about the role of alert brokers. So uh, the idea here is that uh, surveys, say like LSST or ZTF or even like like LIGO, as they detect candidates, um, uh, what, what the brokers will do is they will act as an interface between the surveys and the end user or you know, re resources downstream. So here the idea is that uh, you know, the, the brokers ingest the bulk stream and they essentially filter, uh, you know, either provide uh, services, so an an annotation services, uh, filtering, photometric classification, so it's essentially all, all sorts of data enri enrichment to the, to the real-time um, uh, raw data, uh, data, data streams for ingestion by investigators downstream or to be used by um, other, um, say, robotic telescopes to start scheduling their observations. And, and, and all of this is really important because you know, we are already in the big, big data era and going ahead, uh, this would be, uh, it would be really challenging because we, we expect, uh, you know, order one to 10 million alerts a night with, with future observatories. So if we do get a gravitational wave event, uh, it, we would need to uh, filter out uh, the, the, the true object from, you know, the entire um, collection of, of new objects det detected. And so uh, maybe a future follow-up will look something like this. So you, this is a hypothetical situation where a gravitational wave has been detected, a sky localization has been sent out. Uh, maybe there are, uh, there, there is, I think that, I think my X symbol is right, right there. So the, the true location of the source is right there. But as you get on the sky, you start seeing the, all these new objects, one of which may be a type 1 BC supernova, one may be a type 2 core collapse supernova, and, and possibly there is a real killer nova lying there. Okay. And so I'll just escape out of there and try to play this one. Let's see, okay, there you go. So, so I, uh, ideally we want a, a real-time uh, classification, something like, like this. So this is just taken from, from a code, code base by Daniel Muthukrishna, who is one of my collab collaborators. And, and it's code called RAPID, which is used to uh, you know, give real-time predictions for the different supernova sub subtypes. Uh, and uh, something like this would be really useful with the uh, big volume of data com uh, coming in. So to doing something like this for the gravitational wave candidates would be really use, useful. And so uh, in passing, I do want to mention because there are, uh, there may be several students who are interested in, 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 in big data sets and in, in machine learning. Uh, there is this data set called Plastic, which is a photometric challenge that was conducted in, in, in 2018 to classify different light curves based on their, just their morphology. Um, and and that, that data set is available publicly. In fact, this is what was used to train the rapid algorithm that I showed in the last, uh, uh, last slide. So just, just in case if you're interested. Um, however, I do want to mention uh, that um, photometric information is good, but uh, we can also make use of uh, any contextual information that is available during discovery time. For example, uh, the redshift of the source, if that is av available. So here, for, for, for example, what I'm doing is uh, I'm taking the kilonova light curve from GW1770 and feeding it to this rapid algorithm without any contextual inf information. And if there are 10 classes, I don't expect any prior information. So all classes are supposed to start out at one tenth the probability. And in, in this case, it does not do a very good job because the time scale is really short and rapid is mainly uh, meant for supernova classification. Yes? What's the meaning of the horizontal axis? This is time. In, in days? Days, sorry, yeah. So this is time in days, I'm, I'm sorry. Yep. However, if you do provide, say, the, the redshift of the source, it acts like a prior information. It's, uh, you know, uh, because K 
kilonova are intrinsically faint objects. You expect to detect them closer, uh, and that autom automatically puts a prior, and uh, it's 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 able to um, you know do uh, a, a put a much higher score on the kilonova just ju just from that context, con contextual information stuff. Now, now this is just with stock rapid. We we haven't tuned it to a kilonova only classification, but I just wanted to highlight the importance of contextual information. We don't have the redshift in real time, unfortunately. So, so the thing that I showed last is not quite applicable because you know, just when a new object is detected, we don't know what its redshift is. However, we do have other uh, data products that can act as potential uh, contextual information. So for example, the sky localization and, and features of the sky localization, like, like this line of sight probability, the angular offset from the mode of the sky map, all of it sort of set the kilonovae apart from, from, from the other, uh, other ob objects. And, and they sort of act like a prior to, um, to, the, uh, to these different object types. Okay? So, so that is what, uh, what we, we did. So I realize I have about 15 minutes. So we simulated this, uh, uh, this large uh, light curve, these kilonova light curves. Uh, using the the models that are available today, and uh, we use this uh, library called SNANA to 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 get these light, light curves as they would be observed by by a telescope, say ZTF. We use the 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 ZTF DR3 that is publicly available for this purpose. And so, what you get at the end uh, is a, a sky. Uh, this is the sky map of all the recovered kilonovae, for example, and that's take, taking into account all the detection uncertainties like the Milky Way host extin extinction. And so, so, so you, you are, you're able to simulate uh, these kilonovae as they would be seen by, the, as by, by, seen by your tel telescope. And uh, you, so this is just the distribution in, in redshift of, 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 these, of these objects. But uh, you also need to sim simulate the rest of the sky because you have these contaminants, right? So, so, so we, we, we also do that. We sim simulate several supernova subtypes, style disruption events. So essentially the entire uh, scenario that, we, that, that, that you see over, over here. And we have this big data set which we use for, to, to, to train this, uh, a temporal convolutional network where uh, this basically looks like a, almost like a simple con convolutional network, except that the uh, convolutions, they happen in, in, in a causal sense, such that the output at any one point depends on only the input uh, at that point or the, the history of that. And so, so what we, the way we train this is, so we have the gravitational wave bin binaries from which we get sky localizations, we get the ejecta properties, uh, and then using base star, we generate the sky localizations. Using uh, SNANA, we get the light curves. We also use SNANA to generate the entire uh, other set of objects so, so that we have a full data set uh, with gravitational wave sky maps, the kilonova, and the other objects. And all of that information is fed into this this TCN. For, for the time varying pieces, we use the light, light curve in different bands. Uh, for, the, for the contextual information, we use features of the sky maps, something that I talked, talked about a couple of slides back. And then, and then that is what, what, what we train on to give a real time prediction as the, as the data is, is, is flow, flowing in. And so I'll just show, show some re re results. We, we did not train the data on, on 1708.17, but uh, um, as, 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 as we see that, uh, so this is prediction on unseen data, and mind you, that we trained it on ZTF cadence, but clearly all of, all of these are different instruments. Potentially the data had been taken in a very aggressive cadence, so, so what we find is that um, uh, the classification is fairly robust to this uh, cadence, and, and, and so that is, that is, that, that is good. Um, and th these are some of the other uh, light curves. So we do, in some cases, we do notice a feature like this, like a dip, and that is because oftentimes the training data you have 
only, say, for something like ZTF, which is not very deep, you have light curves that are not really long. So once you start having really long light curves, you um, start seeing the score turn over. But, but that, that can be fixed by augmenting the data. And so uh, here is another one. So this is, uh, so the, these previous results were for GW170817. 802019 NPV was a type 1 BC supernova that was found in the uh, localization area of GW190814, which was one of the very well localized events and generated a lot of interest. Um, but what, what we find is that uh, if, we, if, if, if we feed this to LSID, which is what we call our classifier, uh, it's able to, you know, it starts off with a high probability because it's so consistent with the sky localization but then the consequent photometric information will bring the score, score down. So having something like this is really use, useful to filter out contaminants uh, to, to, to get to the right um, candidate. Okay, so, so regarding that, this is some future work that, uh, uh, that is going on in, in Illinois and uh, overall um, in LSST desk. So uh, that is to, to prepare basically a mock data challenge, but for, for alerts. So we, uh, this, this, this project called Elastic, what we plan to do with it is, is to simulate uh, mock alert streams, including gravitational waves and kilonovae, give it host galaxy information, send it out to the broker teams so that they can test their facilities, um, uh, and, and basically be ready for, for Ruben. I think I finished a few minutes early, so I'll, I'll just leave my conclusion slides up there and uh, take any questions.